audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. Welcome to On The Rock, God's unchanging word for changing times with Dr. Camille Majdali, Director of Teach All Nations Melbourne, Australia. Dr. Camille lived and studied in the Middle East, served as a principal of a leading Bible college and now travels the world teaching God's word. He has an extraordinary knowledge of the Bible and a dynamic ability to make God's truth come alive in a real, practical way. This episode of On The Rock will give you keys to survive and succeed in the days ahead by hearing and doing the words of Jesus. We live, many of us, in relatively free democratic societies. But we must always understand that the opposite side to freedom is responsibility. And in today's program, we need to take responsibility of whether we say yes or no to Jesus Christ. Our series is entitled, The Kingly Messiah, Understanding the Gospel of Matthew, Part 1, a verse-by-verse audio commentary, part of the larger Understanding the Bible series. And the Gospel of Matthew was written to prove that Jesus of Nazareth is Israel's Messiah, as well as the world's, and to prove he is also the Son of God. And one of Matthew's methods is to show how the life and work of Jesus fulfills Bible prophecy that was uttered hundreds of years before his coming to this planet. This particular lesson is called Consequences of Rejecting Christ, found in Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 to 50. We're going to see that there are some grievous consequences for saying no, but some glorious consequences for saying yes. And this is the last lesson for chapter 12. Remember that chapter 12 is about the growing opposition to Christ. So, because it's a longer segment than usual, let me read to you a few things. I'll read to you from verse 41 and 42 of Matthew chapter 12. Jesus speaking about his generation says, the men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold a greater than Solomon is here very powerful words and what is Jesus saying he's actually doing something incredible he's speaking first of all to the scribes and the Pharisees who were the establishment elite of the Jewish people during Jesus' day. And he's comparing them to basically Gentile forces. The first are the people of Nineveh. They are from the capital city of the Assyrian Empire in northern Iraq. Today it's known as Mosul, M-O-S-U-L, Mosul. So the people of Nineveh, they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and yet somebody greater than Jonas is here, and the people in Israel are not repenting. And then the queen of the south is, of course, the queen of Sheba. She's going to rise up in the judgment, and she will condemn this impenitent, hard-hearted generation. You know, she came from the ends of the earth to hear of the wisdom of Solomon, and yet there's a greater than Solomon present. Now, in this particular segment, first of all, Jesus' opponents, the scribes and Pharisees, are going to demand of him a sign. We want to see a sign from you, if you really are who you say you are. Now, remember, he's been showing them signs and wonders from day one of his ministry, but apparently none of that was good enough. No, they have to have their own tailor-made, customized sign. And even if Jesus does give them the sign and fulfills it, they probably still would not believe. Because when your heart is hardened and you've just gone too far, That's it. Your conscience is seared with a hot iron. Jesus tells them that you will not be given any sign except that of the prophet Jonah. You're an evil and adulterous generation. So you get to have Jonas. And Jonah or Jonas spent three days and three nights in the belly of the big fish, and the Son of Man will do the same 
three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. After all that, both the men of Nineveh and the queen of the south will condemn the generation because even though they were Gentile, they responded to the grace, the word, and the mercy of God. But this hard-hearted generation did not. Then Jesus speaks of some very strange things about the unclean spirit. And this particular section could be easy to misinterpret. We will take it at face value, but he'll speak of the unclean spirit and about his mother and his brothers wanting to meet with him. And he points out who his real mother and brother are. Now it's time to read the entire segment from Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 to 50. Our lesson is entitled, Consequences of Rejecting Christ. And again, the reference, Matthew chapter 12, 38 to 50. Let's listen to the word of the Lord. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. And he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mothers, or his mother and his brother stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother, and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples, and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, The same is my brother and sister and mother. Our reading is from Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 to 50. Our lesson is entitled, Consequences of Rejecting Christ. And let me tell you, it's the most foolish thing we can do. If you don't hear anything else today, please hear that. Let's go to the beginning. We want to learn God's Word. We want to apply it to our lives. We want to build ourselves on the rock so that we will withstand the storms that are coming and still be totally intact, full of God's love, joy, and peace. Matthew twelve thirty eight. Seeking a Sign. Whatever we hear in this lesson, remember that what was taught earlier of Messiah validating his claim through inspired words and supernatural work. Yet, his opponents rejected him and accused him at every turn. They finally stooped to the lowest of the low, ascribing to the devil the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit, saying that Jesus cast out devils through Beelzebub. This is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, of which there is no forgiveness. Keep this in mind as soon as you hear the following dialogue and discourse. The Pharisees and scribes are asking Jesus another trick question. Master, we want a sign from thee. Superficially, It appears like a fair question, until you consider the anointed, authoritative discourses that Christ delivers, as well as the works of supernatural power, healing the sick, casting out devils, raising the dead. How many more signs do they need before they be convinced? When you are blind and hard-hearted, it could be a million signs and you still wouldn't be moved. Even as Father Abraham told the rich man in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, What happened to them after death? And the rich man said, send Lazarus to my brothers. 
because they, if they, they hear the words of Lazarus, who is risen from the dead, they will repent. Abraham says they have Moses and the prophets, and besides, if they're not convinced by Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even though someone rose from the dead. Very, very true words. So Jesus is basically facing a group of people who are just not going to repent. Their hearts are hardened, and then that's what inspires them to ask for another sign. And even if it was given to them, or many, they still wouldn't be, remain unchanged. So he does offer them one sign in Matthew twelve thirty nine. He ascribes this generation that seeks a sign as evil and adulterous. And no sign will be given to this generation except one, the sign of the prophet Jonah. Verse 40, just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale or of the big fish. So Jesus will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's how long he will be in the grave, the shortest length of time for any dead person in history. And then, of course, he talks about the men of Nineveh and the queen of the south. These are heathen people we're talking about from Nineveh. And yet these heathen people dwelling in the most grotesque of darkness, and remember they come from the Assyrian Empire, very violent, vicious, warlike, merciless. Yet these people from the most heinous of empires they humbled themselves in sackcloth and ashes and repented at the preaching of Jonah. And Jonah didn't even preach a long sermon. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. He possibly said a bit more than that, but that was the gist. They responded. Even the animals were forced to respond in Nineveh. And Nineveh was spared at that time. Good result. Probably more effective preaching there in Nineveh than any of the prophets had in Israel itself. And then we learn about the queen of the south, or the queen of Sheba. Her story is told in 1 Kings chapter 10. And Jesus says she came from the uttermost parts of the earth, which simply means she came a great distance. Whether she came from Yemen in the southwestern corner of the Arabian Peninsula, or whether she came from Ethiopia, and the Ethiopians strongly believe she did, either way, it was a long journey 3,000 years ago. And she came because she heard of the wisdom of Solomon. But there is a greater than Jonah present and a greater than Solomon and a wiser than Solomon. In fact, receiving Jesus is the wisest thing you can do. And receiving Jesus is God's wisdom in human or personal form. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 30 calls Christ our wisdom righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So righteousness and wisdom are not merely wonderful qualities. They are personified through Jesus. He's greater than Jonah. He's greater than Solomon. And yet, even though he's greater, his opponents still will not turn to God. So he goes on to describe about the unclean spirit. Now remember, this issue of the unclean spirit is linked back to the scribes and Pharisees who will not repent. The teaching here is important, but it can be easily misinterpreted. So my recommendation, let's just take what Jesus says at face value. And remember to whom Christ is speaking. He's speaking to his opponents. Some or many of them have blasphemed the Holy Spirit. So though the Holy Spirit inspired their prophets, they rejected these prophets, and they've rejected even the Messiah himself. So at least they're consistent. They're equal opportunity rejectors. Thus, inspired by their prophets, they rejected all this, and the words that applied to King Saul are now reflected to Christ's opponent. It says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Now, this is talking about the sovereignty of God, and not that it's any reflection on his pristine, pure character. Evil spirits cannot do anything without ultimate permission from the Lord. We read that in Job 1, verses 12, Job 2, verse 3, 1 Kings 22, 19 to 23. Here Jesus speaks that when the unclean spirit leaves a man, he goes through a dry place looking for rest. Does that mean that he can only rest when he resides in a person? Very possibly. But I don't want to make a big doctrine out of it. So then when he goes 
and cannot find anywhere to rest because he hasn't been sent to the abyss yet, he says, I think I'm going to go home in Matthew 12, 44. So he finds his original home in the heart of the person. It's empty, but it's still swept and garnished. Isn't that how the Pharisees were? They actually were spiritually empty, even though they looked all clean and, and bright white and everything else. But remember, misery loves company. In Matthew 12, 45, the unclean spirit, now that he's going home to an empty house, clean and garnished, finds seven other spirits worse than itself, and they go live in the man. And then Jesus makes the statement, the last state of the man is worse than the first. Then with precision, the Lord says, this is what will happen to this wicked generation. Let's do a scorecard. They rejected the word of God. They rejected the son of God. They blasphemed the spirit of God. So they will be sitting ducks for the demonic, which inspires hatred, murder, theft, and destruction. Just remember John 10 verse 10, the devil comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Matthew twelve forty six. mother is calling. While Jesus spoke to the people, his mother Mary and his brethren came to the meeting and wanted to speak with him. We do not know what Mary wanted, but Jesus, being wise and knowledgeable, was in no hurry to interrupt the meeting to have a private family conversation. Some have said that Jesus' brethren were actually his first cousins, implying that he was the only offspring of Mary. But really, there's no evidence for that whatsoever. Verse 47, there's a public announcement. Since Jesus did not come running to speak to his family, someone came to let him know and said, your mother and your brothers are outside wanting to speak with you. I think by that point, the whole world knew of that situation. So Jesus responds with a rhetorical question in Matthew 12, 48. Rather than respond to them immediately, he asks the question, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? The natural answer was obvious, but Jesus was hinting at a greater spiritual dimension. Pointing to his disciples in Matthew 12, 49, Jesus now says that these disciples are his own. Behold, my mother, and my brethren, speaking of his followers, because those who follow Jesus are family to him. And then finally, in verse 50 of Matthew 12, whoever, whether they be male or female, Jew or Gentile, slave or free, that does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother, sister, and mother. So our lesson is called Consequences of Rejecting Christ. And our lesson for life is those who do the will of God are not just members of Christ's church, but also of his family. Remember to visit us at our Facebook page, Teach All Nations Education, and thank you for liking our page. Go to our homepage to subscribe to the free monthly Issachar Teaching e-letter, helping you to become future ready with articles from the Bible, victorious Christian living, and current events in the light of God's Word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Gospel of Matthew. And even though the words are heavy duty, they are still words of life. They are words of conviction. They are words of light. They are words even of love, because you are love. And so, Lord, help us to receive your word in full, and by your Holy Spirit, quicken and guide us how to apply your word to our life, so that we're no longer on the sand, but on the rock. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's On The Rock was brought to you by Teach All Nations. If you would like more information about this ministry, to download podcasts, view our online store, attend special events, sign up for our teaching newsletter, make a donation to support this ministry, or to invite Dr. Camille to speak, log on to www.tan.org.au or write to us at Post Office Box 493, Mount Waverley 3149. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.